Section 10 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society Part 1 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. First Special Report of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, 1871 Report the Great Fire in Chicago occurred on Sunday and Monday, October 8th and 9th. On the 13th, the mayor of Chicago, by the following proclamation, committed to the Chicago Relief and Aid Society the work of dispensing the funds subscribed and provisions contributed for the sufferers from all parts of the civilized world. Proclamation I have deemed it best for the interests of the city to turn over to the Chicago Relief and Aid Society all contributions for the suffering people of this city. This society is an incorporated and old established organization, having possessed for many years the entire confidence of our community, and is familiar with the work to be done. The regular force of this society is inadequate to this immense work, but they will rapidly enlarge and extend the same by adding prominent citizens to the respective committees, and I call upon all citizens to aid this organization in every possible way. I also confer upon them a continuance of the same power heretofore exercised by the Citizens Committee, namely the power to impress teams and labor and procure quarters so far as may be necessary for the transportation and distribution of contributions and care of the sick and disabled. General Sheridan desires this arrangement, and has promised to cooperate with the association. It will be seen, from the plan of the work, which is detailed below, that every precaution has been taken in regard to the disposition of contributions. R. B. Mason, Mayor Up to the date of this proclamation, the work had been conducted by a committee of citizens, who, in conformity with the mayor's proclamation, turned over to this society the funds and material at their disposal by the following communication. Chicago, September 17, 1871 Wirt Dexter, Esquire, Chairman, Executive Committee, Chicago Relief and Aid Society Sir, The General Relief Committee of which we were chairman and secretary, respectively, with headquarters at the corner of Washington and Ann Streets, discontinued all official action as a committee on Saturday evening last, the 14th, and have since referred all official matters coming to us to your committee. We supposed that this fact was generally known, and we now make this formal statement, that you may be assured that there has not been, nor can be, any conflict on our part to possibly embarrass your committee in the full control and direction of all matters pertaining to the relief of the destitute in our midst. Respectfully, Orrin E. Moore, Chairman, C.B. Hotchkiss, Secretary. The Chicago Relief and Aid Society has been for many years, irrespective of sect or party or nationality, the medium for the distribution of the general charities of Chicago, under the following charter, granted by the legislature of the state of Illinois. An Act to Incorporate the Chicago Relief and Aid Society. Section 1. Be it enacted by the people of the state of Illinois, represented in the General Assembly, that Edwin C. Learned, Mark Skinner, Edward I. Tinkham, Joseph D. Webster, Joseph T. Ryerson, Isaac N. Arnold, Norman B. Judd, John H. Dunham, A. H. Mueller, Samuel S. Greeley, B. F. Cook, N. S. Davis, George W. Dole, George W. Higginson, John H. Kinsey, John Woodbridge, Jr., Erastus S. Williams, Philo Carpenter, George W. Gage, S. S. Hayes, Henry Farnham, William H. Brown, Philip J. Wardner, and their associates and successors, 
B and they are hereby created a body politic and corporate under the name of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, and by that name to remain in perpetual succession, with power to contract and be contracted with, to sue and be sued, to acquire, hold, and convey property, real, personal, or mixed, to have and use a common seal, and to alter the same at pleasure, to make and alter by-laws, for the government of the corporation, its officers, agents, and servants. Section 2. The objects of this corporation shall be strictly of an eleemosynary nature. They shall be to provide a permanent, efficient, and practical mode of administering and distributing the private charities of the City of Chicago. To examine and establish the necessary means for obtaining full and reliable information of the condition and wants of the poor of said city, and putting into practical and efficient operation the best system of relieving and preventing want and pauperism therein. Section 3. The said corporation shall be located in the city of Chicago, and the persons named in the first section and their associates or any ten of them, shall have power to hold a meeting thereof, and organize said institution by the appointment of a board of directors and the establishment of such constitution and by-laws as they shall deem expedient. Section 4. The said corporation shall have power to locate and erect, or to lease, the necessary building or buildings, and lot or lots, and employ the necessary agents and officers that may be requisite to carry into full effect the purposes of this act. Also to receive, by gift, grant, devise, or bequest, property, real, personal, or mixed, and to hold and use the same for the purposes of the institution. Section 5. All money and property received by said association shall be faithfully applied to the purposes in this act specified, and it shall be lawful for the said corporation to secure the faithful collection, custody, and distribution of its funds and other property by such bonds and other securities as the Board of Directors shall require, and any officer, agent, or member of said corporation who shall fraudulently embezzle or appropriate to his own use any of the funds or property of the said corporation, shall be deemed guilty of larceny, and liable to be indicted and punished accordingly. Section 6. The business of said company shall be managed by a board of directors to consist of not less than five members, and by such other officers and agents as said board shall appoint. The first board of directors shall be elected by the persons named in the first section, or such of them, not less than ten, who shall attend a meeting, to be held in Chicago at a time and place of which notice shall be given by any three of said persons, and the persons elected directors at such a time shall hold their offices for one year, and until others are appointed in their places, and shall elect their own officers, and have power to appoint and remove all the other agents, officers, and servants employed by said corporation. Section 7. This Act shall be in force from and after its passage. Section 8. That all property, of whatsoever kind and description, belonging to said corporation, shall be and remain free and exempt from all taxes and assessments for state, county, or city purposes. Section 9. It shall be the duty of the said Board of Directors to make a report at least once a year to the City Council of Chicago, giving a full account of all their doings, a statement of their receipts and expenditures verified under oath, also of the property owned by said corporation and the uses to which the same is appropriated, also a list of all the members of said company and of all persons who have contributed to the objects of the same with the amount of their respective contributions, together with such information as they may have acquired concerning the condition and wants of the poor of said city, and the plans and intentions of the said corporation. 
which report shall be published in the official paper of the city, and in such other manner for general circulation as the city council shall direct. Section 10. It shall be lawful for the city council of Chicago to appropriate from time to time such sums of money as they shall deem expedient to aid in carrying out the charitable purposes of said corporation, also to allow said corporation to occupy without rent any lot belonging to the city for the storage of wood, coal, or other supplies intended for charitable distribution, or for any other purpose necessary or desirable to carry out the objects herein specified. Section 11. It shall be the duty of the said corporation to establish, as soon as may be, one or more offices, depots, or stations, in a suitable and convenient place or places in said city, of the location of which public notice shall be given, and continued for such time as may be needful, to cause the same to be generally known in the city, at which places officers or agents of the corporation shall be in attendance, for the purpose of carrying out the purposes of this act, in such manner and under such regulations as the Board of Directors may direct. Section 12. The Mayor of the City of Chicago shall ex officio be a member of the Board of Directors of said corporation. Section 13. It shall be lawful for the Board of Directors to fix the amount, if any, which shall be paid to entitle any person to become a member of said corporation, also to tax each member of said corporation annually a sum not exceeding ten dollars to aid in defraying the permanent expenses of said corporation, also to make such persons, whether residing in said city or elsewhere, who shall, by their philanthropy and benevolence, be adjudged by the board to be deserving of such distinction, honorary members of said association, and to establish life memberships therein by the payment of such amount as the board shall determine, which life memberships shall be free from any annual assessments. Section 14. The Board of Directors shall have power to establish such by-laws for the proper management of the business of said board and such corporation, as they may deem expedient, and to alter, add to, and amend the same. Samuel Holmes, Speaker of the House of Representatives, John Wood, Speaker of the Senate. Approved, February 16, 1857, William H. Bissell. In conformity with the provision of the Charter, in that regard, this society has always made an annual report, under oath of its proper officer, to the Common Council of the City of Chicago, of its receipts, disbursements, and general doings. In accordance with the above proclamation of the Mayor, it now accepted the enlarged trust, created by this great emergency, and assumed on the 15th of October, the work of the care of the sufferers by the late fire. It established its headquarters at once at Standard Hall, and published the following general plan of organization referred to in the proclamation. General Plan of Work of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society Committee Number 1 on receiving, storing, and sorting supplies, and dealing out, upon requisitions, from other committees. Murray Nelson, Chairman, aided by General Hardy. Number 2, Committee, on Shelter, to provide tents and barracks. T. M. Avery, Chairman. Number 3, Committee, on Employment, to provide labor for able-bodied applicants. Chairman, N. K. Fairbanks. Number 4. Committee on Transportation. To provide passes for persons and freight accommodations for supplies. Chairman, George M. Pullman. Number 5. Committee on Reception and Correspondence. To receive visitors and answer all dispatches and letters. Chairman, Wirt Dexter. Number 6. Committee on Distribution of Food, Clothing, and Fuel. 
O. C. Gibbs, Superintendent of Relief and Aid Society, Chairman. Number 7. Committee on Sick, Sanitary, and Hospital Measures. Dr. H. A. Johnson, Chairman. Number 8. Executive Committee. Consisting of R. B. Mason, the Mayor, and the City Comptroller, the President and Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Chicago Relief and Aid Society, together with the Chairman of each of the foregoing committees, shall constitute an auditing committee, and have control of all contributions. No bills to be paid, unless upon checks or drafts signed by the President or Chairman of the Executive Committee of the Relief and Aid Society, countersigned by R. B. Mason, Mayor. The Chairman of each committee will fill up, from citizens who shall tender their services, his own committee making it as large as the magnitude of the work may require, and be responsible for its doings. The clergymen of the city are requested to organize an associate board of directors to that of the Relief and Aid Society, and through an executive committee of their own appointment, communicate with our committees. We recommend the formation of local societies by citizens, and request them through their officers to communicate with the chairman of the foregoing committees on all matters falling under the respective work of said committees. The work of distribution, as now proceeding, will go on until our committees are supplied with force to relieve the present workers, but we request all persons engaged in the work to stop hasty distributions, and give applications as much examination as possible, to the end that we may not waste the generous aid pouring in, as the work of relief is not for a week, or a month, but for the whole of the coming winter, and to a great extent for even a longer period. The business offices of all the committees, except the executive committee and committees of reception and correspondence and transportation, will be at 409 West Washington Street, just west of Elizabeth. No relief will be administered at these offices, they being solely for the transaction of committee business. Applications for passes on railroads will be acted upon at one or more places to be designated by the chairman of that committee. The Office of the Executive Committee and Committee on Reception and Correspondence and the general business of the Committee on Transportation, will be at Standard Hall, corner 13th Street and Michigan Avenue. Home contributions of money will be receipted for at Standard Hall. Chicago Relief and Aid Society, Henry W. King, President, Wirt Dexter, Chairman, Executive Committee. The original working plan, as above published, was found, in some respects, inconvenient, and at the annual meeting of the Society it was modified to this extent. An executive committee, chosen by the board of directors from their own number, is invested with power to transact all business, subject to the supervision of the board. This committee is composed of the heads of the committees and departments. No member of the Executive Committee or the Board of Directors receives any compensation for his services. The Executive Committee, with one or two exceptions, give their entire time to the work. End of Section 10